Bitcoin removes the imperfections of humanity from money. MicroStrategy has outperformed every single S&P 500 company since 2020. And I think that really goes to show you what's the power of Bitcoin. Bitcoin will reset the hurdle rate. And where the hurdle rate in our existing system is arguably just the melting ice cube of fiat money, that's where you get a lot of malinvestment. Imagine if we took all the bright minds and engineers that are in crypto right now and had them working on Bitcoin. How much more powerful would the Lightning Network be or the ARC protocol be? The idea of a company having their treasury in Bitcoin will become a very strong competitive advantage for them. And I would not be surprised if there are MicroStrategy customers where the CEOs of those companies that purchased MicroStrategy software did it simply because they are Bitcoiners. It's one of those things that is underappreciated. I think it's going to be way bigger than, say, the ETFs and you know the impacts that that have had on Bitcoin. New Fed targets no longer too I think it's 3%. They just never said it. They probably never will. It separates money, not just from state, but it separates money from humanity. You have quit a long uh, tech career uh, to do a full-time contemplation. You have done something with AI. You've done something with businesses. Um, how do you think uh, that Bitcoin will impact businesses, startup, venture capital, all, all those things that you maybe also lived through uh, and how will this change when, when Bitcoin is actually a, a full thing, not just like a small asset that some, some weirdos like us have, but like uh, where all the people have Bitcoin and it's a kind of a Bitcoin world. Wow. That's a, that's a big question. I feel like we could do the whole podcast on this, but great first question. Um, yeah. So maybe I'll start with just a little bit of my background for people that don't know me. So I, I spent about 10 years of my career in B2B tech mostly startups. So the largest company I ever worked at was 200 people. So I'm not talking like Facebook, Salesforce kind of tech. I'm talking really small startups. Most of them were in AI. And there were a couple of things that I took away from that experience. And by the way, I, I quit, as you mentioned, the B2B tech world in the past year. And I'm going all in on Bitcoin, all in on content creation, because I want to support this new world, this parallel system that we're building. I'm sure we'll, we'll dive into that more. Um, But to answer your question, like, where do I see Bitcoin and kind of the world of tech coinciding? I'd say that the first thing that notice, I noticed about the tech world is that a lot of it is, how do I say this politely? A lot of it is kind of a house of cards. Like there's a, there's a very close corollary between B2B tech world and venture capital and the fiat money system that we learn about as we go down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And I'm not surprised that my urge to leave the B2B tech world really started to strengthen when I discovered Bitcoin. So I discovered Bitcoin around 2020. I bought my first Bitcoin in 2016, but I quite honestly didn't understand it at the time. I just bought some and had it on Coinbase. But 2020 was when you know the world shut down. You know, be, I'll leave it at that. So you know, get canceled by YouTube. Um, But I just remember thinking, how is it possible that we're getting all these checks in the mail? Like, where's this money coming from? And it was that question that tipped me into the Bitcoin rabbit hole where I learned about central banking. I learned about quantitative easing. I learned about inflation. And, you know, to summarize it, it at least in my view, I realized that a lot of it is kind of made up in a sense. It's kind of fictional. And the system really needs to just keep chugging along in order to survive. And I, I phrase it in that way. It's obviously an oversimplification, but that's very similar to, I think, how a lot of technology companies work, unfortunately. So, um, you know, if you kind of go back in time, when I started my career, I'm 30 years old. So I started my career in 2015. That's when I joined the first startup. Um, money was cheap. Money has always been cheap for my career. So really, unless you're in your 40s, You know, tech has always been, you know, pretty much a great place to be. You know, zero interest rates, money is cheap. There's tons of funding and that's all well and good until funding stops. And I think that's where we start, started to see happen in 2021, where 2020, obviously the events of 2020 occurred, but then inflation started to peak up. Rates started to increase more into 2022, I suppose. And me being in tech, particularly, by the way, I was in the sales world. So I was selling software to large enterprises, large companies. 
budgets started freezing, people were doing layoffs, like tech went from easy mode to hard mode within the space of a year. And that's really where I started to see, okay, everything I learned about Bitcoin from reading Safety's book and, you know, watching Breedlove's podcast and all this stuff, like this also applies to my work. Like my career is very much dependent on the state of interest rates and the fiat system. And I'm seeing my friends get let go at companies and the industry's going down. I'm not hitting my sales numbers. The, the, our lives in tech startups completely shifted. And if anybody's watching this that worked in a tech startup in 2022, 2023, they know exactly what I'm talking about. And I think that's, you know, hopefully that answers your question kind of in a roundabout way, but it's it all comes back to the money. And so I'm hopeful that, you know, Bitcoin is, you know, I don't want to say it's the shot, but I think it's by far the best shot we have at changing the system that we all live and breathe in. It's interesting when I think about, uh, especially also the, the, the startup world, as you mentioned it, um, a lot of things live from the venture capital world and cheap credits. And it's interesting like they are, if you're a person with a lot of net worth, you are incentivized to spend your net worth on uh, gold, Bitcoin, startups, uh, and all those things because the dollar or any other currency is losing rapidly value. What if this isn't the case? What if like Bitcoin is the main currency uh, and you can like safely put it in there and you know your purchasing power will go up like two, three percent every year and you don't have to do anything for that? Then all of a sudden, Bitcoin becomes the hurdle rate and the incentive to invest in risky startups is, is slow or, or, or less uh, incentive. So you only invest in like really hyper um, quality startups and things like you really want to get behind. Uh, so the, the overall capital might decrease for, for startups, uh, but the, the quality might increase is uh could, could that slow down maybe even like innovation to a certain extent or will, will that maybe enhance uh uh innovation because then we have more solid capital it, it's it's something that i'm not sure yet like yeah it's, it's it's a hard topic to be honest for me it is and it's it's interesting because the topic obviously i care very deeply about because you know like you said you don't want to stifle innovation right innovation is of course very, very powerful. It's, you know, we're speaking here on a software using hardware that's all been invented within the past like 10, 20 years. And it's amazing. Like I'm in Seoul, South Korea, by the way. Um, so like chatting with you from across the world is like a miracle in many senses. And a lot of that is only possible when you have capital allocators that take risks. But I think the way you put it is actually perfect, Robin. Like Bitcoin will reset the hurdle rate and where the hurdle rate in our existing system is arguably, you know, just the melting ice cube of fiat money. Like we're just trying to get rid of it as quickly as possible. That's where you get a lot of malinvestment. You have, you know, obviously the whole crypto Ponzi's and that whole ecosystem, you know, Ponzi's at worst, maybe just, I like to call them solutions looking for problems at best. Um, but then you also have, you know, things like WeWork. And it, it, again, in the B2B tech space, um, you know, there's a there's a very famous venture capital firm called Tiger Global. And uh, they invested in one of the startups I was at. So I need to be careful. I don't want to, you know, talk poorly of them. Um, they're, they're legendary investors. They, they, you know, have very seasoned careers. But they were very notorious in the B2B tech space in 2020 and 2021 to basically write a check to any tech startup that had a pulse. They would just throw money at these startups and they would outbid other venture capital firms because they their thesis was just, we need to invest as much money as possible. And it's that, it's that attitude that leads to obvious malinvestment. And, you know, on one hand, I guess to maybe answer your question in a different way, because I've thought about this, is like, is that a, would that be a bad thing if Tiger Global and other venture capital firms weren't able to do that, right? Because that money flows into tech companies and then people get jobs and people work on problems and some of them fail and then they move on. The, the flip side of that argument is what else could those people have worked on? Like all those people that were working at these tech startups that ultimately collapsed, 
could they have worked on something that was more productive to site that didn't collapse? Imagine if we took all the bright minds and engineers that are in crypto right now and had them working on Bitcoin. How much more powerful would the Lightning Network be or the ARC you know, protocol be or Liquid? And that's, I think, the framing that I'm at least convinced of that you know, risk taking is good, but you can also allocate risk in the wrong places and that can lead to negative outcomes. Uh, I love also the analogy with the hammer. I don't, I, I forgot which guest of my podcast said it, uh, but it's basically like uh, people want to put a blockchain and crypto everywhere now. Uh, I mean, the trend is a little slowing down. I feel like uh, it's, it's not that crazy as, as it was, uh, especially in, in the 2017 area and also 2021. Uh, it was pretty, pretty, have, have, uh, pretty massive. But they're like going around with a hammer, at, like, which is the blockchain, and their nail is like, Uh, Bitcoin, but they're also trying to hammer everything else down, and they're like just like, hey, let's right. let's go in the city and let's find nails to like put something in the ground. So it's it's an interesting comparison because I feel like blockchain is only really good for for Bitcoin, like that that's the sole purpose of it, uh, and and the rest is like yeah, it's an inefficient way to to save data. You can do that, uh, but there is more efficient ways to to do that but it, it just wanted to to highlight that and i like a lot that you have in your bio written uh i'm in bitcoin and then not crypto <laughs> so like yeah. that that is really an extremely important distinction for me that th this alone shows that like oh yeah he he understands bitcoin deeper than just like oh yeah it could revolutionize finance no no like he actually did some research he, he did some digging uh because most people that have just surface level is like yeah like i i like crypto i like blockchain like no, no, you, you don't you, yeah <laughs> it's not clue what you're talking he, about but that's just nailed it <laughs> i i on my opinion it's the same robin like one of my favorite or like just i always laugh when i chat with people that maybe aren't interested in bitcoin yet or they're kind of new to the space but they'll say something along the lines of oh i'm not really into bitcoin but I, I, i'm really passionate about blockchain technology i think it's really powerful that tells me that they don't understand blockchain and they don't understand bitcoin and i think it's just you know over time you know people will hopefully learn but i think you bring up another you know interesting point that like I mean, that's why I think content creators like yourself and all the various podcasts that we have in this space, why it's so important because yes, Bitcoin exists and it could pretty much be perfect, right? You know, say for some bugs and updates that need to be done over time, just maintain it. But that's another lesson I learned the hard way in the tech startup world is, you know, this, this phrase of build it and they will come is a complete lie. Like you could have the best product and If you don't sell it, if you don't distribute it, if you don't educate people about it, people aren't going to come. And there's stories of this if you look at history. I think probably the most famous one for millennials and you know maybe you know Gen Gen X would be VHS and Betamax, where Betamax was a superior technology, but VHS won because it just had much better distribution. And probably people like my age and younger don't even know what Betamax was or never used one because they don't know what it is. <laughs> It, I don't. I never used one either, but I just I heard the the story of it, which was it was a better product by you know most metrics, but it failed because VHS. I, I always I always compared with Blu-ray. Do you remember Blu-ray? Blu-ray, yeah, it's like another great example. Yeah, yeah. Everyone is like, yeah, that's the future, and then yeah, we have everything digital. <laughs> we don't need those right. CDs anymore. But it brings up an interesting point. Why did you then decide to go full time in content creation and, and Bitcoin and are now so immersed in the community? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for for segueing us there. So this maybe takes us out a, a bit out of the Bitcoin space, so just a bit about my personal life. So um, I met my wife in 2020. We actually met out of one of the startups we were working at. Uh, that startup shut down, so it's kind of funny. The co-founders often comment to us that we are the the phoenix that rose from the ashes of that, that startup. But anyways, we met, um, she is Korean and but we were you know met in Canada and we were working in Canada. And um, again, don't want to talk too much about politics or you know the events of 2020, but Canada was not a great place to be for a few years. And I had lived and was born in Canada, lived there my whole life. And I was like, you know what? I don't want to 
grow old here and die and never have lived anywhere else. And simultaneously, my wife, girlfriend at the time, wanted to live closer to family. So long story short, we moved to Korea. And so the reason I bring this up might sound irrelevant to you know the tech story, but um, part of that is that she's a full-time content creator. Even though we met in tech, she you know, loved creating content on the side. She loves fashion and skincare and, you know, things that women love. And she was posting content. And when we moved to Korea, I said to her, you know, you seem to enjoy this side hustle of yours way more than you enjoy sales enablement and marketing operations and all this tech stuff, you know, working in spreadsheets. Why don't you try doing this full time? Pretend it's your job. Don't worry too, too much about money. I'll keep working for my startup. So that's another interesting story there. I actually worked from Korea 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. for close to a year, about 10 months, just like like a vampire um, remotely because that was possible, you know, with technology. But anyways, I did that while she was kind of focusing on content creation full time. And I think it was within like six to nine months, she was making more doing content creation, something that she loved doing, had way more freedom with her her schedule and what she just enjoyed doing. She was making more doing content creation than she ever did in her tech career. And that one, obviously I was proud for you know my partner to do that, but that was like a light bulb moment for me where I thought, wow, content creation can be a business. Like it's not just where I think, especially like millennials like myself, I think maybe we, we see you know YouTube or podcasting as kind of more of a hobby, or at least I did for a long time. I enjoyed them. I love consuming them, but I didn't really think that it was possible to make that a business and turn that into a living. And when I saw that, again, simultaneously, while I was getting more and more passionate about Bitcoin and this whole new world, I thought, you know what, this is this is what I want to do. And, it, and it's funny that you mentioned that you're, you want to do this podcast for 10 years. Cause that's exactly what I said to myself. I could show you a note on my phone where I wrote in 10 years, I want X, Y, and Z for my content creation. And, you know, we could talk about low time preference and all those, you know, things, how Bitcoin changes us and transforms us. But, you know, that's kind of the, the long story short was uh, my wife was a content creator that kind of woke me up to the possibilities and I decided to follow in her footsteps. And that's so fun. Uh, I had to I had to smile because my I keep my girlfriend uh, a secret for now, uh, but she also does skincare and fashion, and she also does content creation. Oh, I love <laughs> Just, it! There you go. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> maybe we it's have to connect formula. them at some point. <laughs> for sure. Uh, really interesting. Uh, that's that's uh, just for you as context. Why why I smiled when you said that she makes skin or not? Because I, I I think it's funny. It's just because uh, my my girl also does the same thing. Amazing! I love uh, it. Really cool. Um, with with Bitcoin, um, it's 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 interesting. Basically, f first of all, like even outside of Bitcoin, content creation is actually one of the fastest growing markets. When you look at how many people are full time in content creation, how much money uh, is in content creation. Um, yes, it is like uh, the top few uh, people make like almost the, all of the money. So most people who do content creation do it as a hobby, do it as something on the side. And some people don't even want to do it full time. Some people have just like a once in a month podcast they want to do uh, because they really like to have this once in a month conversation and they don't even have uh, any intention to monetize it. And I think there is this mindset coming from that it's not a business. It's like, I don't know, some people like to brew beer in their garages like every once right. in a while and they, they don't want to make a business out of there, but they're really big uh, uh, beer brewing businesses. Like there's a lot of examples of that with content creation because it's like, when are you a content creator? Because if you tweet one time, like, oh yeah, you create a content that's available, for, like then you're a content creator. Like almost everyone is then a content creator because sure. every, almost everyone made an Instagram story once in their life. Uh, so that's kind of like, uh, I think it's a weird thing because every there, there are like 3 billion content creators out there <laughs> when you see it like that. Um, they're really cool. Um, what, what is, um, I think you're, because you have those goals with 10 years, because you have the, that mindset, uh, I guess you have an, an answer for that. What is the impact that you hope to have in the Bitcoin community? Or, or like, what is the, the drive to like 
uh, why Bitcoin and and those those things? Why is that uh, the big passion of yours? Yeah, it's it's a great question. I think I, I listened to the episode you had with uh, Julian uh, Figueroa on from Kinetic Finance, a uh, great content creator that I admire and love his work. And he said something um, that I that resonated with me, which was basically like I want to get as many of my friends and family, the people that I care about, on board. Right. If, 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 you know, if I have a lifeboat, obviously I want to, I want to share it with as many people as I can. And so content creation to me is kind of a, an extension of that. Now, I think I might be taking a bit of a unique approach, maybe not unique. I don't want to give myself too much credit, but at least, you know, different from say the podcast you're producing or what other great content creators like Julian or Bram or um, other kind of Bitcoin focused podcasts are doing, which was, I kind of thought to myself, you know what? There's a lot of great Bitcoin podcasts that I love. You know, I love listening to what is Bitcoin. Now it's Mr. Obnoxious. I love listening to what is money, which is, you know, Robert Breedlove's show, um, Safety's podcast. But before I was in Bitcoin, I never really was interested in Bitcoin. And so my goal, like I named my YouTube channel Wealth Potion, for, for instance, it doesn't really directly reference Bitcoin. Because I want to create content that's kind of, I, I kind of want to orange pill people with the kind of sly roundabout way, if you will. Um, so if I think back to my own orange pill journey, again, going back to 2020, it was learning about quantitative easing and inflation and interest rates and these kind of somewhat boring topics. Um, but I was just really interested in learning about because it just didn't make sense to me and I just wanted to dive into it. And then by accident, almost, I got to Bitcoin. And so I'm not straying away from creating Bitcoin content. Like one of my better performing videos right now is about Bitcoin and why it's different from crypto. Um, but I want to kind of have Bitcoin more in the backseat and let people arrive at that answer themselves, if that makes sense. And maybe I'll share another quick kind of anecdote from my time in um in tech startups. So as I mentioned, like eight of those 10 years, I was in sales. And I think sales is one of those interesting kind of professions where I think it has uh, a kind of surface level uh, definition, very similar to Bitcoin, right? You mentioned Bitcoin to someone, they immediately get some words pop up in their head, like crypto or blockchain. And when you mentioned sales, I mean, studies have actually been done on this, that people think of used car salesmen and telemarketers and sleazy and smarmy and these kind of negative words. And one of the first things I learned in sales is that like a professional salesperson, they're not really trying to convince anybody of anything. They're actually asking a lot of questions to get the client or the buyer to come to that conclusion themselves. It's very similar to the movie Inception, if you've watched that movie, where you need to plant the idea deep enough where they feel like they came up with the solution themselves. You're just asking them questions about their problem, basically. Right? Like if I'm selling, at one point I was selling event management software. So I would ask, you know, how are you managing your events today? Oh, you're using paper and pencil. Well, have you had any problems with that? What have you tried to do to solve that? How much time are you spending on that? How much do you think that's costing you? And I'm just asking a series of open-ended questions to get them to realize that there's something wrong. I'm not coming to them and saying, hey, like you need to use our app because it's way better than pen and paper. You know, it's it's so uh, taking that mindset, I thought, huh, maybe I can kind of take some of that learning that I had from the tech startup world and apply that kind of method, I suppose, of communication to Bitcoin. And so right now I've been really just focusing on content around these kind of you know, somewhat boring, but I think important economic topics like inflation and central banking. And then hopefully through that, people will see the hints that I'm dropping. You know, like I use the Bitcoin logo orange in my logo, you know, so that people know, hey, okay, there's some there's some Bitcoin here, but it's not all about Bitcoin. I laughed at a lot. This was, by the way, also like one of my reasons why I named it Robin Sire and nice. uh, not anything with Bitcoin. It started the first, I think, four episodes were like the Bitcoin path. Uh, but I was like, yeah, I don't want that. Uh, and it gives me the opportunity to not do rebrandings because I see as what Bitcoin right. did. He is also now doing a, a big rebranding. That's always like a hard thing to do. 
Uh, I see some other Bitcoin podcasts, like uh, I think the Progressive Bitcoin podcast. I think they're planning a rebranding soon. I saw something on Twitter. I might be wrong on that. Uh, yeah, and I saw some other podcast. Oh yeah, and, and there are some other. Um, uh, yeah, there's some other Bitcoin podcasts and some other brands that I see like, oh, they're, they're doing a rebranding. They're doing rebranding. Oh, they had done a rebranding. Uh, even Matthew Greta, uh, Bitcoin University uh, was before the Trader University. So right. like, there have been always like rebrandings and brands. And I'm like, I don't want to do rebrandings. <laughs> like, I, I will always call myself Robin Sire. And so like that, that's probably really consistent with me. And if, if it's not, Obviously, from the first uh, moment they see that it's not Bitcoin, yeah, then then it's not that obvious, but they will get to it. One thing that I'm also um, interested in, uh, what you said uh, just really briefly before that you moved to South Korea and mm -hmm. uh, you left Canada. Uh, you mentioned a little bit your your why there, uh, but did this change your your view in any ways? Because I think South Korea could can be uh I'm, i've never been to canada <laughs> never been to south korea so i cannot really say but they, they probably are quite uh different in the culture uh did this change your view on on bitcoin on wealth on, on business maybe indirectly i think it changed my view on a lot of other things in life that maybe indirectly changed my views on money and wealth i don't think my views on bitcoin changed i'm, I'm still you know irresponsibly long there but um I, I would say that, you know, a couple of things, maybe I'll comment on it. One, I was lucky that even though I lived my first 30 years of my life in Canada, I did do an exchange semester in Poland and I did one work internship in Malaysia. So I had spent, you know, two, three months abroad and that kind of gave me that little seed in the back of my head that like, hey, traveling is pretty cool. And I don't just mean traveling to like go to a resort. I mean, to like live somewhere else. Like that concept was really attractive to me. So um, I guess one takeaway I'd share there, if there's any young people listening to this, if you're in high school, university, college, like if you have an opportunity to travel, I would take it. Um, how has it changed my view though? I think, oh man, like the cultures to your point, it, like they're vastly different. So I'll try to oversimplify here and be generous because I, again, I love Canada. It has a special place in my heart. You know, I, I mean, I have all my family's there. My friends are there. But Canada is a very, um, it's a very sheltered place. And I think a lot of this has to do with its history. I mean, I'm half Vietnamese. My, my mom and her Vietnamese family all escaped the Vietnam War and went to Canada because Canada was considered a very safe place. It was under Pierre Trudeau, which is Justin Trudeau's father, um, who, you know, welcomed a lot of refugees during the, the Vietnam War. So I'm very thankful to Canada. Obviously, I wouldn't be alive. Um, But because of that, Canada has become very, very comfortable. I'd say that's the biggest difference, say, between Canada and the United States is the United States has this, you know, this um, competitive nature to it. Like they want to win. They want to be number one. You know, whether you agree with that or not, like that's where a lot of people go to do business. You know, there's not a lot of Canadian startups that are very successful, by the way. Right. A lot of talent goes from Canada to the United States, as an example. And so just to give some anecdotes around Canada being a very comfortable place. Whereas Korea, South Korea is very different. If anyone's been to South Korea, I mean, one, it's very Korean. It's very homogenous. And I actually, I think there's a lot of benefits to that. I don't say that in an insult at all. And like, I am very grateful and blessed that I'm in the country at all uh, because it's incredibly safe. It's incredibly clean. Um, the standard of living and like the cost of living is quite low. The standard of living is quite high. Um, it has its challenges. The birth rate here is the lowest in the world. And the biggest reason for that is, you guessed it, cost of living and you know housing is expensive. So a lot of young people don't feel like they are ready financially to own a home. Which again, goes to your question around Bitcoin. Like I am so confident that Bitcoin is the solution to that. Um, now, one other side to this where South Korea is different is that, um, how do I put this? It's, it's a collectivist country. And I think that sometimes can sound like a bad word to Westerners like myself. Like I grew up in Canada. So I was very much of a, like, I want my individual rights and like collectivism is bad. And certainly there's dangers to it. I mean, China is one example where it's, you know, your freedom of speech is certainly not nearly as protected there, but South Korea is a democratic country. There are, you know, 
two main parties and, you know, I can go out on the street I and mean, it's, it's 8 PM right now, but if I were to go out on the street tomorrow during the day and I'm chatting with someone about politics, I could speak my opinion openly, either criticizing or praising the party that's in power and no one, no one would care. And ironically, even though a lot of Westerners think of Asia as being less freedom of speech, largely because of China, I couldn't do that in Canada. My political views in Canada were not welcome. I would probably have been fired from all three of those startups if I were to be completely honest with my political views and just think about what was happening in my country. And so I, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I think needless to say, it was a huge culture shock to see how different the world is just from you know picking myself out, out of the country that I was born and raised in and then dropping myself in a new country. And I, I think often about this analogy, uh, it's, it's, it's more of a joke, but it's relevant here. It's, you know, there's two fish and they're swimming and uh, one fish goes to the other fish and says, hey, the, the water's warm today, isn't it? And the other fish goes, what's water? And I think it's a perfect analogy for people that are just like, I know so many Canadians that love Canada, think Canada is the best place in the world, but they have never lived anywhere else. And if they've traveled, they've like gone to an all-inclusive resort in the Dominican Republic and that's travel to them. And I just think the world is such a diverse and beautiful place that um, I didn't want that for my life. I don't want that for my kids. And um, yeah, it's been a, it's been an adventure so far. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit Bitbox dot swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and the next step is to really level up your sovereignty as an individual you have to have the most secure self-custody setup you have to secure your own devices you have to protect your privacy you have to set up an inheritance plan and depending on where you live you even want to have a plan b a citizenship where you can move in case something goes really really wrong and through all those steps the Bitcoin Way is guiding you through step by step. And if you visit the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash Robin, you even get a 30 minute free call to find out how you can level up your sovereignty. And last but not least, I have something completely new for you guys. I partnered up with Coin Vigilante. This is the most beautiful Bitcoin timepiece that I ever saw created by anyone. Look at that beauty. I love it so much. Coin Vigilante made an perfect bitcoin watch that's the perfect subtle elegant way to go out there and show that you are a bitcoiner and that watch brand is bitcoin only and coin vigilante just dropped a completely new and amazing genesis edition of their watch collections you have the date of the first ever mined bitcoin block in there and of course also the block height and which epoch we are currently in i love the level of detail they put in in this masterpiece and make sure to check out those amazing coin vigilante timepieces down in the descriptions i love those watches so so much it's so interesting for me um because that's, that's actually a question I'm, I'm wrestling with. I mean, it has absolutely zero to do with Bitcoin. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it's when I see that there's this concept of wealth creation uh, where you either stay at one place or you move around a little bit. And then I even like uh, researched that at one point and finding people uh, that are now really wealthy uh, if they moved a lot in their uh, life or if they just stayed at one place. I think the most famous example of like staying at one place and, and getting really wealthy is like Warren Buffett. Uh, mm. I think he's famous for like still being in the same house he was in like with, with 20 years old or something like that. Yeah. 
Uh, so that that's like one one example of that. There's some other examples who have moved, like Elon Musk moved uh, from from I think South Africa. He is right, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, then there are like examples like uh, Jeff Bezos who has moved from Albuquerque, uh, but he is not complete like the same basically the same country, and he just moved like once uh, for Amazon. Um, so so that's an interesting thing because I also thought about okay maybe because this year is the first year where I'm location independent and I could go wherever I want to, to, mm. to be. Um, but uh, it's like, you have to get your stuff there and then you're like, oh, let's, let's settle there. And what yeah. is different there? The, then there might be like tax advantages. There might be the cultural differences. Um, uh, so you have to have like either a reason to go out of Austria or like a an, an reason to go in somewhere else. Might be El Salvador, might be an interesting place. There's a lot of Bitcoiners, even like from German place. I think Mark from Bitcoin Hotel Blochingen is, is one famous example right now who decided to go there. Um, but for me, it's like if, if nothing pushes me out really of Austria and it's a interesting place because it's also in the EU and I'm... <laughs> focusing a lot on focusing um, I'm seeing a lot of politicians in the EU and I'm like yeah I don't know if I'm, I'm really <laughs> liking what's in the direction we are going but still till now it's, it's fine but it's an interesting conversation of like um, moving around a lot um, uh, or like like I know that experiencing and, and really like seeing other countries is amazing for yourself and I did that already a lot um, but if, if like moving around a lot, like um, I forgot the names, how, how they're called, uh, digital nomads. Yeah, mm. digital nomads. Uh, I right. was also thinking of like maybe starting that, but there are a lot of disadvantages also that that with, totally. with the moving around. But uh, I just like wanted to, to throw that out because it's a, a question I've been wrestling with uh, this year a little bit uh, as it's the first year that it's even possible for me. <laughs> right. I mean, I think well, a couple of things I'll say, I'm, I mean, this is how I approach, you know, my YouTube channel. And when I chat with friends and family, like I try not to prescribe anything. So I obviously don't know your situation, Robin, and like the details, but um, what I would say is, you know, I think what you said is really instructive, right? Like you have this opportunity that you never had before. And that was certainly one of the reasons for me was, you know, I was working remote, you know, in a weird way because of what happened in 2020 and how, you know, in office work didn't happen. So I just took advantage of that situation as best I could. Now, obviously, a million of things could have happened and I could have ended up not moving abroad. I could have ended up, you know, moving somewhere else if I didn't meet my, my wife and all this stuff. So I think life has a way of working itself out. I wouldn't necessarily force it. But if you do have that, like, inkling, that, like, that, like, feeling, I think, there's ways to at least explore it. And, and maybe I'll share, actually, this is maybe actionable for you or anyone listening. Like before I decided to move to Korea, like I'd never been to Korea before. So I actually did a month in Korea. Um, Canadians, I think, can be in Korea for, I think it's 60 days, but certainly at least 30 days. Um, so I did a month in Korea and just tried the food, tried living more like a local as opposed to just like staying in the hotel and doing the touristy stuff. I don't think I even went to any touristy you know, I haven't even been to the palace and I've lived here for you know a year and a half. The palace is like a massive tourist attraction in Seoul. And so you can kind of pilot it out in small doses and just see if you like it. And then the other thing I'll say, honestly, like I think what you're doing with the podcast, like speaking with so many people from diverse backgrounds like that obviously doesn't replace geographically moving and living in a new culture. But you're certainly getting a wide array of perspectives and information that the average person isn't. So you know, I think, you know, it is the is the end goal just to live in another country for the sake of living in another country? Or is it to expand our mind, like you said, to, to build wealth, not just monetary wealth, but just life experience and perspective and open mindedness? Like, I think there's other ways that you can do that if you say, try it and aren't a huge fan of, you know, living somewhere else or digital nomading. So um, every I, everyone's I'm, I'm, path will be different. I love that a lot. I'm a big fan of having a, a home base uh, and then being as free as possible. So you can still like, oh, like I, I will be now three weeks in America, then like four weeks. Obviously, that's uh, a big luxury that you have to work a lot towards because like <laughs> every travel uh, is like you have to pay the flight, you have to pay this. It's it's also time that goes yeah. away. If I, for example, travel now to America, I do it 
I travel uh, in November to El Salvador to Bitcoin adopt, adopting Bitcoin conference. Nice. But that's a whole day that just goes by with just traveling. Like that, the cost me a whole day. Uh, I think that's a big expense that people don't think about. Uh, the traveling expense, not just like the, the euro amount that you spend, but also the the time that you spend on there. Uh, but it's a wealth worth it. Yeah, I think that that that's for sure. One question that uh, comes came up to my mind uh, right now is. Um, what do you think will Bitcoin do to our view of, of wealth? Like how we view uh, how, how rich and how wealthy we are and, and, and how, how our view of, of time and all those things? Yeah, oh, that's such a good question, Robin. And honestly, I think I was having, I had a similar thought in my mind when I used the word wealth there because it's such a, it's such a powerful word. And, you know, there's a reason I named my channel Wealth Potion and not Money Potion, right? I think money, of course, is a huge part of wealth like we live in a world where where money is energy and you know <laughs> quote michael saylor here for a better analogy but it is if we spend our time which is our most finite resource being productive doing work providing products and services and we're compensated in money because it's the most liquid form of you know value that we can we can come up with and of course, that money is going to enable all the other things that we want in life, whether that's, you know, uh, you know and uh, there's, you know, there's this trope, you know, money can't buy happiness. Well, it can, you know, yeah, I can't buy the emotion of happiness, but it can certainly buy things that provide you with happiness. And, you know, if you really care about your family, I mean, money can help you support your family. If you really care about, you know, um, pick your poison, if you really care about your friendships then obviously you can buy gifts and experiences for your friends if you, you know, really care about your health you can pay for a personal trainer you can buy more healthy foods you can buy a gym membership so money is the fuel that enables us to achieve those other things and at least in my mind i think wealth is a bit more encompassing than money now that being said i have had people that you know i said oh wealth potion that seems very just about financial and i suppose it is but at least to me i think one, wealth is broader than just, you know, monetary units. And two, I think in a sense, everyone can come up with their own version of what a wealthy life is, right? You know, I, I really care about, for instance, having, you know, my, you know, having my own home. I would ideally love to have a place in Canada where my family is and then also in Korea where my wife's family is. Um, other people aren't as big of a fan of that. Maybe they, you know, their version of wealth is, you know, living in a cabin and being off grid. Maybe some people love the city life, right? So anyways, I, I think wealth can be a lot more rich and diverse than just money. But at the same time, money is a big component of it. So I don't want to take away from, you know, the monetary element, I suppose. Absolutely. And for me, um, other people might see it differently, but for me in wealth is health in there. Like if, mm -hmm. if you are truly wealthy, like there's health in there. Uh, there's like a lot of uh, interesting stories around that. But if if you have, uh, if you have all the money in the world, but but you cannot even go out of your bed because you have some sickness, uh, some illness, what does it really like? <laughs> what do you totally. really have then? And that's what uh, a lot of people don't don't see. It's also. It's actually a comment I get a lot because I do a daily Bitcoin podcast. And for some reason, people think that I work like 100 hours a week to keep it up. It's not that much. It's like 35 to 40 hours plus then some additional work with like sponsors and uh, additional work with uh, things. So it's probably more than the average person works, but it's not that crazy. It's not Elon Musk level till now. I think he works more than me. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 definitely interesting to have uh, have. I love the word wealth, to be honest. I know it's it's not as uh, as popular sometimes, but uh, I love that you call it wealth portion, not money or like anything else. Like wealth is an, it's a good one. But mm -hmm. did, did you already uh, orange pill your your family? Is is that already? <laughs> did you I have already orange pilled some of them. So my so I, I think I messaged you this on Twitter. So I the first person probably I orange pilled, aside from my wife, to you know convince her that being irresponsibly long Bitcoin is a good thing. I orange built my dad and uh, he is, he is all in, I don't want to say all in like net worth wise, but he is fully, you know, orange pilled. Um, he also mines Bitcoin, which is harder for me to do in, you know, an apartment in South Korea. So I'm, I'm very proud of, of his Bitcoin journey. Um, I have a lot of like cousins and, you know, more 
kind of extended relatives that I haven't orange pilled yet, but um, I'm hoping hoping to to do that in you know 2024 2025 a uh, time frame for sure. And, and maybe just one quick comment. You just remind me when you're talking about wealth and, and the wealth potion thing. Um, we you know w- the reason I named it wealth potion by the way is just a play on words of health potion, right? I, I'm 30 years old. I'm a millennial. I grew up playing video games, and you know generally there's like a health potion item where you you pick it up and you get like inspired and you, your, your character regains health and you can continue playing the game. And I thought that that was like a fun way to connect with younger people, right? I, I've heard from a lot of content creators that one of the best ways to create content is just create content for your younger self because they're, you know, one to two years behind you. And, you know, there's going to be people that are in a similar space. And I guess related to this is I'm, I'm very passionate about education changing. I think the future of education is going to be podcasts like yours. It's going to be YouTube channels. It's going to be TikTok, whether we like it or not. It's, you know, screen time is going up and, you know, we can obviously look, see a lot of the downsides to that, right? With the rise of ADHD and all these challenges, you know, learning challenges that kids are having, but in an element, and as much as we can limit screen time and, you know, there's ways to kind of foster a more healthy relationship with screens. The the reality is we have more screens, right? When I was growing up, it was like Nintendo 64 and I could play over one hour a night and that was it. Right now, kids have screens everywhere, right? They get laptops in school and, you know, they probably have a iPhone by the time they're in in like high school as well. And so I think education is, is quite frankly changing. And I think the future of education is going to be online. And to connect this back to Bitcoin, I think it's going to be decentralized. I think is not, you know, as much as there absolutely is this um, kind of long tail or as Nassim Taleb would put it, like extremistan, right? You have these creators that are, you know, making tons of money and there's like a kind of larger base of people that are doing it more as a hobby. I think over time, there will be more and more content creators that are able to do it and earn a full-time living and they aren't, you know, making millions, tens of millions of dollars. Um, and it's just going to become more and more mainstream. And I think that's a that's a great thing. I mean, universities and higher education have been getting themselves into plenty of scandals over the past few years. And, you know, when I speak with young people, again, I try not to prescribe them, but I usually emphasize the downsides of just blindly going into a university degree because that's what their parents told them to do, or that's what, you know, society tells them to do. Because I think that whole world is, is changing very, very rapidly. Uh, very cool. Uh, I, I probably don't follow that rule of um, making content for younger people as my average age for uh, the viewers here is 47. Oh, wow. That's interesting. <laughs> and uh, I have like three times as many people over 65 than under 25 and I'm like 26. So uh, mm-hmm. mo- all like 95% of my viewers are older than me, <laughs> which that's, is interesting cool, uh, to, to see. Um, but as this brings me to the next question you said like uh, content creating for for young people and the wealth portion are uh, really interesting what amount do, do you have a framework for like what amount of bitcoin should young people try to accumulate to be wealthy in their 30s 40s 50s when they come closer to like uh retirement and all all those things did, did you do you have a, a framework for that or a way to think about that i I think of it more in terms of like principles and patterns. I try not to subscribe too much to like models. You know, I, I, you know, I'm a Bitcoin, Bitcoiner circa 2020, which is when plan B and, you know, that model was very popular and it, you know, uh, it got destroyed pretty much. And I know right now there's the power law and I've I've had some Twitter back and forth with Giovanni, very smart guy. I think he was on the podcast, if if I recall, or, um, that, yeah, that's awesome. And and so I think models are useful, but I am just very cautious of using them as predictors because you know, what's that saying? You know, uh, all models are useful, but they're all always wrong. Or I, I can't remember what the saying is, but. Oh, um, uh, like uh, every model uh, is, they are all useful, but they all, I also don't know it. I thought I'm new. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. You, you know the one we're talking about, but yeah, that like, 
so anyways, to, to answer your question more directly, how much how much Bitcoin should a young person accumulate? I mean, the obvious first answer is get off zero, like get some. Um, you know, my first Bitcoin purchase, it was, again, 2016. I think it was in the, the high hundreds of dollars. I probably bought like $20 on Coinbase, if I remember. It wasn't much, but it was something. And I think that first purchase, it's like a lot of content creators talk about this too, like earning your first dollar online changes everything because then you start to, it's, it opens up this whole new world. I think Bitcoin is similar. Like once you buy your first few Satoshis, then you start to, you know, learn about what this investment is that you're holding, or at least you should, you should start to learn about what is this thing? Maybe I'll go check out the white paper and read that. Maybe I'll go read the post that Satoshi posted on the, Peer to peer foundation forum. Oh, he mentions that the problem is central banks can print money. Well, I don't know much about central banks. I should learn about that. And, you know, I think it's the curiosity, the, the curiosity that leads a young person to buy their first few Satoshis is the curiosity that's going to lead them to be wealthy. Right. So I think it's less about how much Bitcoin do you own? It's having that mentality of open mindedness and learning because like, I'll be honest. And this maybe is, you know, uh, not, not the best best thing to say, but like the first time I heard about Bitcoin was not 2016, it was 2013. I was in university, one of the top business schools in uh, Canada. And I think you had Jesse Myers on the show as well. He wrote this legendary article back in the day of how like the yuppie, you know, yuppie, I forget how he phrased it, but like the yuppie like consultant class are the, the most likely to miss Bitcoin because they are stuck in these like business school models. And that was me. That was me in business school. I was like, Somebody mentioned Bitcoin to me. I was like, what is this? this is, what is a silly thing? It's a toy. And that, like, looking back, I was so wrong. And it was just because I was close minded to it. it. It had nothing to do with me knowing better. It was just I completely brushed off the idea because it would have forced me to challenge the things that I was learning in business school. And I think that's that's like the number one kind of takeaway, I would say from like a mental model standpoint, it's just beware of closed mindedness and do whatever you can to continue learning and continue, you know, foster a love for learning, right? Like that's, that's, you know, I know I'm all over the place here, but one other thing I'll say, like, I think the best teachers and the best content creators for that matter are not necessarily the ones that are best at teaching. It's the ones that are the best at fostering a love for learning. The ones that, want that get people interested. And that's why I think it's no surprise that education and entertainment has kind of kind of morphed into edutainment, what people are calling now, where people want to learn, but they also want to be entertained because that makes it fun and that makes it engaging and it makes them come back the next day to learn more. And so anyways, I, I went off on a tangent there, but yeah, I'm very passionate about that. Yeah, I, I, I love how you have framed it. Also the the answer of like let's get off zero first uh is is perfect because i think it also we were talking about earlier of planting the seed uh that's just like gives you the, the opportunity to learn about it and, and experience it actually so like that's that's like um i always say like if if you think uh that bitcoin even has like a one percent chance of completely uh revolutionizing the financial world even if you just put it at a one percent chance you should put at least 1% of your liquid net worth in Bitcoin and see what's happened because it's not a lot. If you're wrong, like you, you lose 1%, it's not that much. Um, but if you are uh, right and you haven't uh, uh, if, uh, at least bought 1% of it, you're standing there with like empty hands. And that's that's probably the, the um, that's probably the most dangerous place to be, uh, not having any Bitcoin in a Bitcoin world. <laughs> like that, totally. that seems to be an, an awful place uh, to be. And also like um, the one question that I probably should have asked way earlier than, than that, uh, as you're coming from AI, what do you think is the connection between AI and, and Bitcoin? Is there a connection? And will AI usually like choose Bitcoin or <laughs> that, uh, do transact as they probably don't have a bank account? That's a good question. I, but the short answer is I don't know for sure, but I'm, I'm happy to share my opinion from what I've seen working at, you know, two AI startups now for about seven years. I think... Maybe I'll start with this, which is less about Bitcoin, but just about AI in general. I think AI is revolutionary, but that it is certainly in bubble territory. And I think, you know, there are a lot of similarities to the 
dot com bubble of 2000. You know, I was too young to really understand it, but obviously, uh, having studied it and looking back at history, and you know, you know, watching a lot of financial analysts that did, you know, work and invest through that period, you know, I think some of the similarities are that yes, the internet was revolutionary. It completely changed the world, but the hype really spiked in the beginning the hype bubble burst. And then we started to see the real use cases really get built out. And it wasn't in a matter of months, it was in a matter of years. And don't get me wrong, like AI has the potential to move a lot faster than the internet because it's kind of recursive in that sense. But I still think something similar is going on where there is more hype than there are real use cases of AI today. Now that can change rapidly. I could be proved wrong very, very soon, but I think it's very frothy right now, as as investors might say. You know, if you're investing in Nvidia stocks, for example, you know, could there be more upside? Absolutely. I mean, Fed just cut rates. China is, you know, shooting a liquidity bazooka at the Chinese economy. Like, we could get, you know, further stock market all time highs for another few months or even quarters. But do I think that it's going to just keep going up and to the right? until AI has, you know, transformed the economy. No, I think, I think there is going to be some sort of correction. That's at least my, my take on the finance side of things. Again, not financial advice. Uh, when it comes to Bitcoin, though, I think, yeah, I mean, I think there is a clear connection to AI agents for, for, for those that aren't familiar. You know, AI, there's ChatGPT, which is a chat interface, but an AI agent is, is an AI that can then go off and do its own tasks. And so it, it becomes agential, agential, I think is the term people are using, or, agent, or agentic, where it's, it's not conscious, you know, I don't want to get a little metaphysical here, but it can conduct its own tasks and follow its own instructions, and then it can come back to you with a report. And, you know, if you tell your AI agent to, you know, go book me a trip, you know, book me a trip to New Zealand, a one week trip, I really love seafood. I'm allergic to gluten, you know, book me all these details and it needs to make transactions to do that. Why would it use the US dollar? Why would it use any fiat currency, right? It would very likely use a digital, a digitally native currency. And, you know, you, you know, this is where obviously as a Bitcoiner that thinks that most of crypto is a scam, I think it should be Bitcoin. It should be on the lightning network. Now, Sam Altman is the head of ChatGPT, and he's also a huge, I don't know exactly his role, but he's involved in that like whole world coin thing. So, you know, is there a world where these AI companies start using these private cryptocurrencies to transact? It's possible. I won't love it, but I do think it's possible. And so, you know, I don't have a definitive conclusion there. Obviously, I think Bitcoin should be that currency because it is the most de decentralized. It is the most widely distributed. It has the immaculate conception, if you will, of, you know, not having VC backers in it. But I'm sure there's going to be efforts from the crypto ecosystem to finagle their way into these AI models and be the transaction medium of choice. Um, so, yeah, crypto is not going any away anytime soon, as much as I hate to say that. Yeah, I also think so. Um, it's interesting because you brought up NVIDIA and this shows the power of Bitcoin in the last four years since MicroStrategy adopted a Bitcoin standard in their company. They have actually outperformed every single S&P 500 company, including NVIDIA. And that is something uh, that will give uh, every... <laughs> uh, S&P 500 CEO and shareholders a lot to think about because there's this one company that was on a downward trend that was kind of having a business model that is getting outdated. Uh, and all of a sudden they adopted a Bitcoin standard. They are developing new business uh, models around that. Uh, and they completely fuel their um, business with that. Like I'm big on like, buy Bitcoin, not like some, some, some stock that have Bitcoin. Um, but MicroStrategy has outperformed every single S&P 500 company 
since 2020. And I think that really uh, goes to show you what's what's the power of Bitcoin. Uh, that I just want to bring that in, as as you mentioned, NVIDIA. And I think NVIDIA is, is in a, might be in a bubbly state. I have no clue because uh, I, I've been a stock pro before. Like I, I've come from a stock pro background, uh, but I have not researched any stocks since... Uh, 2021 so like three years i have really no clue about nvidia right, right. uh but it seems like there's a lot of hype around it uh and 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 bitcoin seems just to be the like the obvious choice right now for me at least um yeah it's it's interesting how do you see like when 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 all the public traded companies see more and more what's going on with with microstrategy i mean dell kind of might yeah. be moving, but maybe. The, the, the things they are, the, maybe they are moving slower than MicroStrategy. Well, you know what, Robin, do you want to hear my, like one of my hottest takes actually? So, okay. So to give some context, the last startup I was at, we used AI to conduct competitive intelligence, which is basically a fancy way of saying that we helped large companies like a MicroStrategy track their competitors and what their competitors were doing. And one of the things that I learned working at an industry is that, you know, when you get to these like really large enterprise companies, a lot, like a lot of people like to think that, you know, at these high level sales deals that it's like really, you know, it's really about the product, right? Build it and they will come. This product is better than the others. A lot of these products do a lot of the same things. And there's very, like the differentiation between two enterprise software products is really in the margins and deals like a sales deal. If someone's evaluating say MicroStrategy versus Power BI or Domo or one of these other business intelligence platforms, you know, that deal could be one just because the sales rep took the person out for dinner one more time. So they went golfing and they really liked each other. Like that's how a lot of these enterprise deals are still done. And I don't, I, again, don't want to, you know, I'm just using that as an example, as an illustration, right? I'm not saying that that's literally what happens, but my point is that differentiation happens on the margins. So here comes my hot take. What happens when Square needs a business intelligence platform? Or if they're going to, maybe they already use one, but they're coming up for renewal on their business intelligence platform and they need to evaluate the platforms on the market. What happens when SpaceX or Tesla or one of Elon's companies, you know, needs a business intelligence platform. I think the idea of a company being, having their treasury in Bitcoin will become a very strong competitive advantage for them. And I would not be surprised if there are micro strategy customers where the CEOs of those, those companies that purchased micro strategy software did it simply because they are Bitcoiners. And they want to support another Bitcoin company. And that is another way that I, I think that's a whole subject that is not talked about a lot. We talk a lot about, you know, this parallel system that's being built. And, you know, you feel it too. You mentioned you're going to go to El Salvador if you've been to other Bitcoin conferences. Like you want to transact with Bitcoin vendors because, you know, you want to contribute to that circular economy. I think that's going to happen at the B2B scale with like six figure, seven figure, eight figure deals. And I think that's like, we're very, very much in the early innings. I mean, just the fact that no other company has really done what MicroStrategy has done yet. I mean, there's Meta Planet out in, you know, just, just next door to me over in Japan. Um, but very few public companies have caught on. And I think that is going to change. And I think there was a, if I recall correctly, Michael Saylor was talking about this recently. There was a recent change to the way um, fair value accounting is done that could open up the floodgates. So if there are any, you know, CFOs out there that have been watching intently at MicroStrategy stock performance, right? Like publicly traded companies, they have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders. So you have to, you have to at least accept that every Fortune 500 company is at, at least aware of what MicroStrategy is and at least a surface level understanding of what they've done, right? No CFO of a Fortune 500 company is being asked by another CFO over dinner Oh, do you hear about MicroStrategy? The CFO is not saying, no, what is that? Right? Like they, they have to be aware of these things. So I think it's just a matter of time. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to get too like hyper bullish and like excited, but I think it's, it's one of those things that is underappreciated. I think it's going to be way bigger than say the ETFs and, you know, the impacts that that have had on, uh, on Bitcoin. But yeah, that's, that's maybe my hottest, my hottest take. 
That's actually something that's coming up to the fast speed rule. Uh, it's, I think, yes, the 15th the of December. I, I just like research quickly because I knew it's either November or December, but here it says like 15th of December. Uh, and for some uh, institutions, uh, 15th of December 2025, it seems like there's like a uh, difference be between what kind of institutions. But mm -hmm. I just like quickly read something. Uh, that's actually one of the, like, this year is pretty crazy. We had the halving, we had the uh, Bitcoin ETF, uh, we have a major election uh, in America where all of a sudden the one, like one of the um, uh, candidates with Trump is actually um, uh, embracing Bitcoin to a certain extent, even though it's really, <laughs> he also in, in, uh, embraces crypto. He also has his own token and, and it's, it's a little weird uh, what he does with, with Bitcoin and crypto. Uh, and, but there are a lot of like RFK and his administration, other, other people. Uh, River Ramaswabi, I think he also understands Bitcoin way better. Uh, JD Vance is, uh, I think, underestimated in the Bitcoin community. He's really also um, way more Bitcoiner than Trump, I think. And also even like his, his uh, this is his brother, his son. No, uh, uh, Donald Trump Jr. I don't know. Like uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't follow him that quick. But there's like someone in his area. Uh, it's also really big on on Bitcoin. And then we have this fast speed rule. A lot of people think that's one major catalyst that's not talked a lot because it's just like an accounting rule and nobody cares about accounting rule. But it really changes something for big businesses. Uh, so this this year is uh, could be could be huge for like end of next year. Uh, when we look back uh, and all the things settle in. So I also try to not be too hyper bullish uh, and, and settle myself, definitely. Like I, I want to be not like uh, be crazy and like, oh shit, I have to get now every Satoshi because maybe we are next year at like 500,000. I don't think so. Uh, right. So uh, I, I want to also <laughs> downplay my own bullishness. But with interviewing every day a Bitcoiner, it's actually really hard to stay not too bullish. It's, it's, it's really hard. I, I hear you. I, I bet. And, and the one thing I will say, like, while I try not to make predictions of a certain price at a certain date, I think it's going up, right? Like I'm, I'm irresponsibly long. I think, you know, I, I think again, Julian said this and I fully agree with him uh, when he was on your podcast that I think one of the only bear cases for Bitcoin is a fiscally responsible government. And I just don't see that happening ever in our lifetime. And, and it's not even like a, you know, a libertarian like governments suck kind of view. I think they just have no other choice. They have no choice but to keep printing money because they are so indebted. And by they, I'm really talking about the US, but it's really global at this point that they really have the, the other options would be austerity or defaulting on the debt or some AI miracle that creates so much abundance that, you know, everyone is like rich and, you know, like they're, they're so out there in terms of probability that I think by far the most likely outcome is just continued financial repression, just continued two to 3% inflation. Maybe it spikes back up to like four or 5%, but I think the new Fed target is no longer 2%. I think it's 3%. They just have never said it. They probably never will. But I think we're just going to slowly see that melt, that fiat ice cube melt away a bit slower than it has before. And they're just going to pray and hope that it still melts slowly enough that people don't notice. Yeah, uh, I think also like all those globalizing effects and AI and getting more efficient, those are all the things that actually could kick down the fiat can a little bit longer because when we get more efficient, uh, this makes things cheaper. And then the money printing with inflation is not, that noticeable Bingo. so uh that 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 could actually be happening uh, i think all those getting more efficient trends is really good for the fiat system to uh work a few more years a few more decades maybe even uh longer that we that we want uh, i hope it goes away soon but i think it will be around for a long time uh in some way or shape or form with a different name and instead of the euro it's the digital euro or whatever but uh, it will be there in in some capacity i think at least yeah really cool yeah. then uh um, we are coming closer to our end uh, and uh, one question that i ask every one of my guests is what can we learn from you besides uh bitcoin great question i think 
has mentioned, I'm trying to educate people through Wealth Potion around financial concepts that you could say are kind of leading indicators into Bitcoin. The topics that I learned about on my path to becoming a full-blown Bitcoiner, such as quantity of easing, central banking, inflation, the economy, um, particularly macroeconomics, less so about microeconomics. But I think another one, you know, I touched on it a little bit in our, our chat today, Robin, is, you know, leaning on some of my experience in the tech startup world. So, you know, a big part of that was around sales and persuasion and the kind of the game theory behind, you know, adoption of Bitcoin. I think that's a very fascinating side of things, right? That's why I get excited about this, you know, FASB rule and these, you know, other events that are happening in Bitcoin, because I think over time, that's what's going to drive adoption. And, you know, Bitcoin is perfect as it is, but a perfect product does not equal adoption. Um, so those I'd say are the the main things that uh, you can learn learn from me from. And you know, one thing I always say in my videos, like I'm always open to feedback, right? Like if people start, you know, go, going on my channel and start commenting, hey, I really want to learn about this other thing, like I'm happy to dive into that and learn about it myself because I think learning. I'm very passionate about learning be, being a fun and engaging thing. It's it's not this like one to many, you know, classroom. It's it really should be engaging and a dialogue like podcast. And so um yeah. That's those are the things I'm teaching about now, but that could all change in a year. So I'm excited to see where my uh, my content creation journey takes me. I love that. Also, like the the feedback, I think the the best content creators are always those who um, grow with their community and really do a project with the audience, and not just like, oh, I I will put out a video every day and just like put something out there, and uh, who who likes it likes it. I think the when when you take in the consideration consideration of the audience and and figure out okay what they actually want to consume. Uh, and with like what you actually want to do and that middle ground because where like people love it and you love it that's like the the, the sweet spot i guess uh and uh that's that's very nice that you you mentioned that i could nerd out about uh social media and contemplation a lot but uh it's it's a bitcoin podcast it's uh, i try to <laughs> keep that yeah there. we can we but can chat about uh, skincare and fashion trends another time yeah. for privately <laughs> <laughs> maybe <laughs> yeah uh perfect then uh, thank you so much uh, we have other end routine where the pre uh, previous guest is asking a question for the next guest um and i can't believe that that question never was in the end routine of the of the podcast and it's uh, such a simple question but a question that we should even ask yourself uh, even though we are already all in in bitcoin but the question is from the previous guest what is a bitcoin that's a big question I have to think about it's, this it, one for a it, moment. It's funny. I think nobody ever asked me that. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like I, I, I can give like the literal kind of boring definition, but I'll, I'll try to channel my inner Michael Saylor and give something a little bit more creative. Bitcoin removes the imperfections of humanity from money. It's, you know, if you're, I don't know if you're religious, but if you're convinced that, you know, men, humanity, humans are sinners, then we will corrupt whatever we get our hands on. And I think Bitcoin removes it from our control. It's the, you know, it's the rules, not rulers meme. And I think that's, that's at least the answer that comes to mind to me right now is it, is it separates money, not just from state, but it separates money from humanity. And we uh, we can't mess it up. We just have to learn to trust it and have faith in it. Absolutely, I love that a lot. Really, really cool. Uh, yeah, then thank you so much, uh, Brandon, for for being on my show. Thank you so much for spending the time with me. Um, before I let you go, where can people find you, ask your questions, and and reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Firstly, just want to say thank you for for having me. It's been, it's an honor. I've I've been catching your episodes, and will definitely continue to do so. So keep it up. Um, where you can find me, I'm mainly on YouTube and X, formerly Twitter, and my handle is at Wealth Potion. Uh, I'm also on Instagram and TikTok, but less active on those. And last but not least, if you like emails, I also have an email newsletter where I kind of write out 
my kind of YouTube videos and ideas. So if you prefer reading as opposed to videos, I have that available as well. But it's, yeah, it's just Wealth Potion. People tell me also I should do that with my episodes, but till now I didn't. Yeah, thank you so much for for Brandon for for your time for being on the show. Also, thank you so much for everyone that is watching and listening for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye bye.